Hello, this is Professor Kreider, and this is Adaptations of the Newborn, and this is the second part of um, our discussion of the care of the newborn baby and the adaptations they make as they're transitioning from life inside the uterus to life outside the uterus. These are our objectives from which our course is, um, our course of job objectives are built. We are going to assess the physiological changes that the newborn experiences to adapt to life outside the uterus. We're going to talk about nursing actions and actions by others that really aid the newborn in adjusting during the first four weeks of life. We're going to summarize some of the major nursing actions that are necessary to maintain and promote safety for the newborn and to really kind of eliminate any hazard, hazards that can come their way and try to optimize their adaptation. And we're going to evaluate parental and newborn interactions. Remember when we were talking about the assessment of the physical newborn baby, that all newborn babies are in a state of adaptation. And for the first 28 days of life, the newborn is called a neonate. Um, really, they have to, all of their body systems have to physiologically uh, change and adapt to external uterine life. They're cardiovascular, they're respiratory, they're hematological, immune, hepatic, GI, renal, and, and thermoregulatory adaptations all need to take place. Now there are some things that assist the newborn baby in doing this. You, know, you have to understand the newborn baby has to um, undergo some really major changes. Their whole circulatory system changes their respiratory system changes as well as the other but cardiovascular and respiratory are two very big dynamic changes that the newborn undergoes. The baby has to change from obtaining oxygen from his or her own environment uh, into you know to receiving this on his or her own where in utero mom's body helps take care of this for the baby. When you're looking at the physiological and psychological basis for newborn adaptation, the newborn's ability to transition from external, uh, internal uterine life to external uterine life really depends on a couple of things. You want to remember the baby is moving from a state of dependence to independence. So the baby's ability to adjust depends on the genetic composition that mom and dad give to this baby, factors that may have occurred um, in utero, care that the baby received during birth, and care during that early neonatal period of time. All newborn babies lose weight, and we talked about this before. It's normal for them to lose about 5 to 10 percent of their initial birth weight, but the red line in the sand is 10 percent. We don't want them to lose more than 10 percent. Here is an example of the calculation that we do to calculate their weight loss and what normal um, versus abnormal weight loss is for them. You want to remember your conversions. One pound is equal to 454 grams. One ounce is equal to 28 grams. And here is an example of a newborn baby born 10 pounds, 5 ounces, born yesterday. So we're going to calculate their weight. You would take 10 pounds times 454 grams, which equals 4540. And then you don't want to forget the ounces. So you would take 5 ounces times 28 grams. That equals 140. And you add those two together with a total of 4,680 grams. The max weight loss for that baby is 10%. So you would multiply 4,680 grams times 0.10 and that would equal 468 grams. So that baby, the max allowed for that baby to, to lose would be 468 grams. Baby is also adapting from fetal circulation to newborn circulation. They're changing from placental gas exchange to pulmonary gas exchange. There are a, a variety of factors that can lead to this one of which is the release of catecholamines that are critical to um, assisting in the transition to external uterine life. There are also changes in fetal structures such as the foramen ovale, the ductus arteriosus, the ductus venosus, and the arterial arteries and veins. Gas exchange in utero happens at the level of the placental wall. 
So during the time that the baby is in uter in the uterus, oxygenation and gas exchange with CO2 and waste products diffuse through the maternal fetal circulation and the oxygen rich blood will diffuse um, into the placenta and return back to the baby uh, through the way of the umbilical vein. So the baby is adapting from fetal circulation to neonatal circulation this process, and it's a very dynamic process, is going to begin uh, with the infant's first breath. You're going to remember when this is occurring early in the um, newborn adaptation period of time, we're going to frequently assess this new baby's vital signs, their circulatory function after birth, just to make sure that their cardiovascular system is adapting properly. There are a variety of factors that assist the baby in tra transitioning to um, neonatal circulation from fetal circulation. There are chemical, thermal, and environmental factors that, in that assist with this transition. The systemic vascular resistance increases. The blood that was flowing through the ductus arteriosus slows. The left atrial pressure rises in response to the increased blood uh, blood volume to the lungs and there is an increase in blood flow or systemic resistance which forces the closure of the foramen ovale. All of these structures, the bypasses that we discussed in the heart, your foramen ovale, ductus venosus, um, ductus arteriosus, the, the umbilical vein, they're going to become ligaments. So one of the initial tests that is done on the newborn baby uh, is the CCHD test, which stands for the Critical Congenital Heart Defect Exam. Um, it is using a non-invasive uh, structure of assessing the pulse ox um, of the baby, one of which has to be the upper right extremity and then another extremity of the nurse's choosing. But you are going to assess a pulse, ox a pulse oximeter reading in the left upper extremity and then a lot of times the nurse will choose either the opposite lower or the opposite hand uh, to assess where the baby's pulse ox is um, where it is at. The baby has to be 24 hours old for this test to occur and you want a couple of things to happen. First, you want greater, we like the baby to be greater than 95% and you don't want anything greater than a three, de three degree difference. So you want them both to be over 95% in both extremities and nothing larger than uh, greater than three degrees. If the baby passes this test, then that's good. If the baby fails the test, they're going to repeat it again in an hour. Um, if the baby fails that test, they're going to repeat it again in an hour. And if it fails that one, then they're going to look at, maybe we have to do some additional testing, like looking at blood flow studies to determine does the baby have con congenital heart disease. Um, they are going to further evaluate. We don't routinely assess the blood pressure of the newborn baby unless clinically indicated. The blood pressure in the newborn baby does change. It increases initially after birth, then it drops for several hours later. And it's really directly related to their total blood volume. Heart murmurs in the newborn baby are really common. Uh, their circulatory system is adjusting to the, really, it's a whole dynamic change, the whole circulatory system. Pulmonary systems are changing. so. The newborn baby's circulatory system is in a state of adaptation. It is not uncommon for newborn babies sometimes to have what's called a transitional or transient murmurs as the baby's circulatory system adjusts. If that heart murmur continues, it doesn't go away, they will continue with some further cardiac assessment like doing um, an echocardiogram or further diagnostic tests. We also not just only assess the color of the newborn baby and the face and centrally, but you want to look at the peripheral circulation. And a very common finding, and we assessment finding, we talked about this in the newborn assessment, is acrocyanosis. Remember, their circulatory system is still in transition. A lot of times you'll see acrocyanosis if the baby becomes chilled or cold. We, we don't want them to become chilled or cold, but it can happen. And you will see a distinctive color change, like their hands and feet will, may become more bluish in color or purplish in color. Persistent acrocyanosis needs to be further evaluated. 
this baby that you're looking at has acrocyanosis in the face <clears throat> and this baby has acrocyanosis in one of the buttocks it's more commonly seen in the baby's hands and feet like you see in this picture Let's talk about the respiratory adaptations that newborn babies undergo. Remember they are with the baby's first breath, their cardiopulmonary systems are changing. So their need to take in respirate to take in oxygen from their environment and begin respirations immediately is an immediate physio physiological need and adaptation that the newborn baby has to make. When the baby's in utero, they do start making respiratory-like movements about 11 weeks of gestation. However, those movements are not regular, regular and they're not um, efficient enough, and their respiratory system is not um, mature enough to allow and support respirations outside the uterus. But by 34 weeks of gestation, those respiratory movements are more regular, and the baby's lungs are moving more towards a mature state where they can support respiration and the process of respiration outside the uterus. Birth really causes an abrupt change in gas exchange from placental gas exchange to um, pulmonary gas exchange. There are a variety of reasons that cause the newborn baby to start to breathe. They, these include the chemical, thermal, environmental, and mechanical uh, mechanisms that assist the baby in starting to breathe on his or her own. Don't let this slide overwhelm you. Um, there are a lot of factors here that that um, play a role in the newborn baby starting to breathe on his or her own. You have chemical stimuli, a, a change in the baby's PaO2 um, or their PaCO2 levels and their pH levels, which cause a stimulation in the respiratory centers of the brain to cause the baby to start to breathe. You also have sensory stimuli, the sound, the light, the pain, touch, and smells that are in the room that the baby is not accustomed to experiencing will encourage the baby to start to breathe. In addition, auditory, visual, olfactory, and tactile uh, chemoreceptors in the baby's skin um, help initiate respiration. You have thermal stimuli, such as a change in temperature, such as the cold temperature of the room. Um, mechanical stimulation, such as chest compression, chest recoil, um, which cause and the the expulsion of lung fluid, um, all play a role in the these um, stimulation of the newborn baby taking a breath. So, for example, in looking at the chemical components, with the cutting of the umbilical cord, that removes the the oxygen supply, so the baby gets a small amount of asphyxia, and that will cause an increase in their CO2 level and a drop in their O2 level and a little drop in their pH, which makes the baby um, makes them experience a little bit of acidosis. And in that acidotic state, it stimulates the respiratory centers in the medulla and the chemoreceptors in the carotid artery to initiate breathing in the newborn. When you look at the mechanical components to this, um, as the chest passes through the through the maternal uh, bony birth canal, the baby's lungs are compressed. And so some of that um, pulmonary fluid that's in the baby's lungs is expelled. In addition, the subsequent recoil of the chest wall, once the baby is born, produces passive inspiration of air into the lungs. And the chest expands. There are some things we can do to stimulate a baby to breathe. Applying tactile stimulation may be necessary, such as, you know, kind of drying them off firmly, um, flicking the, the heels of the baby's foot, and rubbing the baby's back. When you look at the newborn baby's respiratory system, remember they the respiratory rate on, normal range is between 30 and 60 breaths per minute. You're going to auscultate their their uh, lung sounds for one minute in the normal newborn nursery and when you're in labor and delivery we may not do that as we, as long because we may need to uh, resuscitate a baby but in the newborn environment you're going to take a little bit longer period of time to evaluate. I usually tell students just take a couple 
of seconds and just watch the baby breathe have your stethoscope on watch the baby breathe get accustomed to how fast they're breathing or how slow they're breathing and then begin your counting um, it is very normal for normal newborn nursery students to um, be told to, to auscultate for a full minute because the newborn baby's initial respirations are regular they're shallow they're unlabored and they take these short periodic pauses they're called uh, short periods of apnea they're usually okay if the baby doesn't take anything longer than 15 um, seconds you want to see symmetrical chest movements you want to see equal rise and fall of the chest and the abdomen you don't want seesaw respirations um, remember the babies are obligatory nose breathers we talked about that in physical assessment but that comes back again here when you're talking about their respiratory system adaptations you want to assess for their breath sounds to be clear um, to be you know they should be equal bila and bilaterally uh, heard and you want to make sure that you note that we do not see any grunting nasal flaring or retraction